Hello, everybody. I am Frederick L. Milliken, Executive Director of Phoenix Masonry Museum and Library and producer of our Masonic video podcast, Phoenix Masonry Live. Our latest video is not an interview of a talented Freemason, which is our usual format. This time, we will take you to a lecture of Latter-day Saint and brother Lance Kennedy of the Grand Lodge of Texas, AF and AM. We are at Plano Lodge number 768, where Worshipful Master Sean Henry holds monthly Masonic education lectures by featured guest speakers he invites to his lodge. This is one of many in a fine series of top-notch speakers Worshipful Henry has booked for his lodge and the edification of all Masons in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. The speaker we shall see in this video, Brother Lance Kennedy, is a Latter-day Saint and a Mason, and his subject is The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Freemasonry. Let's join Worshipful Henry now as he introduces Brother Kennedy. Attention. I want to welcome every single one of you to Plano Lodge number 768. It is an honor and pleasure to have you all here. and It's a pretty good crowd, so I'm really excited about it. So with that being said, without further ado, and I completely forgot all of my notes to introduce our uh, guest uh, lecturer this evening. So I will give him the pleasure of talking a little bit about himself before we get started. But I want to... Uh, it's dangerous. Milligan. <laughs> yes. Oh, Fred. Yeah. He is taping and recording, uh, so if you have a question, stand up and speak up so he can get it on his mic. And can y'all see this? I mean, can everyone see the, the screen? I mean, can y'all? I'm going to be walking in this area, um, so I just want to make sure everyone's cool with that, and then I'll be turning around to read uh, when I need to read something, okay? So I just want to make sure everyone can see as much as possible. Okay, good. All right, so without further ado, I want to introduce you, Brother Lance Kennedy. Well, um, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, Plano Lodge had been recommended to me, I mean, throughout the years as like an exemplary, awesome lodge. And I finally was able to visit uh, maybe, what was it, three, three month, months ago? Three, four months ago, and just thought it was great. It was a great experience, beautiful lodge room, great location, great brothers. So I want to applaud you all for having a wonderful lodge and for hosting events like this. Masonic education should form a core component of what we do as Masons. Yes, charity is very important. Yes, fraternity is very important. And of course, our ritual is very important. But as we go through our journey and after we've been initiated, we need to constantly grow as Masons, expand our knowledge base. And that in turn will improve us as men because we'll have more context for assimilating knowledge and so forth. So I just want to applaud you all again for having this event. Um, but without further ado, um, my name is Lance Kennedy. Uh, I'm a Master Mason. I've been a Mason for about 11 years. I'm a plural member of University Lodge 1190, Highland Park Lodge 1150, Jewel P. Lightfoot number 1283. 1283. Uh, it's the lodge I'm active in here in Dallas. I'm a full member of the Texas Lodge of Research, and I'm also a Master Mason and a member of the Harvard Lodge of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts which is uh and a brother milk uh so they 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 got a southerner up there in in yankee land and uh, i make sure I, I i jab them as much as possible uh, but i'm active in the york right and scottish rights as well um anyway uh i'm going to start beginning this lecture by with going through some uh preliminary materials to kind of contextualize give us a road map of where we're going to go in this discussion and what we have here the title of the lecture being the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and freemasonry is a image of the Salt Lake Temple. Now, how many of y'all have been to Salt Lake and have seen the temple before? Okay, so several brothers. Beautiful building, landmark in the center of Salt Lake City. Um, there's a, a landscaped Walden area uh, that surrounds it called Temple Square. And if you're ever in Salt Lake, I would just encourage you to at least look at it architecturally and so forth, because we're going to talk about some of the stuff that goes on inside that building and the history surrounding it. So first thing I'm going to talk about is nomenclature. Uh, this image here is the highest uh, image of what's called the First Presidency 
or the highest governing body of my church. Um, I believe it was October, a statement was given by the president of our church that we are to discontinue using the term Mormon or the Mormon church uh, and the like. Um, so in this lecture, I won't be using those terms out of deference to our official position. Instead, I'll be giving reference to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the shortened form, the Church of Jesus Christ, or the church. Um, just as reference, so y'all can follow me as well. I'll also reference members of the church as Latter-day Saints and not Mormons. Um, and as I said, this is in deference to uh, my church's official policy. So an overview of kind of what we're going to uh, go through during this discussion is, first of all, the historic context, the connection between the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Freemasonry, our fraternity. Uh, brother, there was a brother back there with a, what was your name again? You, you, oh, my right. dual brother. <laughs> Kelly Roberts. Kelly Roberts. So, uh, Brother Roberts uh, and I, prop we share something in common. We're both uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> And we're both Freemasons. So uh, this context, this intersection is probably uh, very important to uh, Brother Roberts and myself, but I hope you find it uh, interesting as well. Second of all, we'll talk about Joseph Smith and his connection with Freemasonry. Freemasonry and the endowment. And what the endowment is, is a, a ritual, um, or as we would call it, an ordinance that's very similar to an initiatory experience in our temples. An overview of what the endowment entails. Freemasonry in Utah, and then my interpretation of the connection between Freemasonry and the church. Disclaimer for Brother Kaysen back there. <laughs> um, I will try my best to keep the discussion free of theological speculation or theological discussions whatsoever. However, when discussing the temple and its rituals, it's sometimes necessary to provide a doctrinal context. I am also an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so my discussion will be colored by terms such as the, quote, prophet, etc. These are terms of respect, nothing more. Additionally, I will adhere to the prohibition of discussing the precise nature of the endowment or other temple ordinances. That being said, I'm going to discuss the temple in a much more open terms than most Latter-day Saints would be comfortable. So, are you all ready to get into it? Yep. All right. All right. So there are two common objections when I mention the connection between Freemasonry and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. First, Freemasonry is evil, and the Church of Jesus Christ's connection with Freemasonry is proof that it's evil. Note, the connection is Joseph Smith's membership in the fraternity, and more especially the commonalities between Masonic ritual and the endowment ceremony conducted in LDS temples. Second, Freemasonry is a medieval organization and early Latter-day Saints leaders, such as Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, believed it was of ancient origin. <clears throat> this is proof that the church's first two prophets were misled and false prophets. I believe there are satisfactory answers to both questions, which will be answered and, and will be the basis of tonight's study. So what we have here is a map. <clears throat> Would it be easier if I stood on this side, do you think? Do you all see? I'm just wondering. A okay. little bit, maybe, yeah. Let's try it out. I don't want to... Block. Okay. Is this better, you think? Yeah. Okay. So what we have here is a map of North America in 1844. There are two cities on the map. First, or two, two cities, two towns, whatever you want to call it. The first here at the top is Nauvoo, Illinois. Nauvoo, Nauvoo Illinois was a virtual city-state run by the church uh, in the latter years of Joseph Smith's lifetime. Uh, it was uh, really the, the, the location where much, much of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ um, distinctive doctrines and practices developed. Because it was in the earlier period of our church's history, uh, most of the commonalities between Protestantism and uh, what we term as Mormonism were very similar. But the distinctive practices came about in Nauvoo. But down here in Texas, where it says Marshall, my family was living in 1844. Uh, we, we moved to the Republic of Texas and were uh, established our residence, not me, but my ancestors, in Marshall, Texas. So at the time that many of my ancestors were living in Texas, there was another city to the north where there were important historical events going on. And what we have here are a picture of two Freemasons, Sam Houston and Joseph Smith. 
Now, in 1844, when Joseph Smith was at the, the height of his power, the, uh, he, like I said, he had the largest militia force, private military in North America, 5,000 men at arms, called the Nauvoo Legion. He had uh, virtual, complete, and utter autocratic control over uh, Nauvoo and the church, 30,000 members. Sam Houston was the president of the Republic of Texas. And Joseph was looking for a way to escape the constant persecution that members of the church had experienced. Uh, for the previous 15 years, 14 years, um, our church and members of our church had been forced out of around four states, um, sometimes at, uh, in very violent confrontations. Uh, we're the only group of Americans uh, of European descent to have what's an extermination order uh, given about us. Governor Boggs in Missouri ordered um, the uh, Mormons, members of the church, to be driven out of Missouri at uh, the uh, either by extermination or any other force whatsoever. And that, that order was not rescinded until the 1970s. But Joseph was eager to leave the United States, leave persecution behind him, and find a new place to dwell. And he actually sent accredited, um, he wasn't a, uh, a, a national uh, president or so forth, but he actually accredited ambassadors to negotiate the purchase of South Texas uh, for a Mormon kingdom. And uh, Sam Houston was actually quite enthralled with the idea because 5,000 men at arms on your southern border with Mexico would provide a buffer state between your hostile adversary and you. So the fledgling Republic of Texas was very interested. However, as the turn of events happened, Joseph was killed, martyred, and the negotiations ceased. His successor, Brigham Young, decided that it wasn't wise to move the fledgling church into a war zone and instead took them to the Salt Lake Basin. So that's the rest of history today. So this is the beginning of our cultural context. <clears throat> so Joseph was a Mason. So let's talk about where his uh, masonry began and where his introduction to masonry. Joseph's father and older brother Hiram were Masons in the 1820s, and were, as were many of Smith's, the Smith family's neighbors in Palmyra, New York. To not be at least dimly aware of masonry in western New York in the middle to the late 1820s was impossible. Uh, we're all familiar, or most of us are familiar, with the Morgan Affair. It almost destroyed the fraternity. And if you're not familiar with the Morgan Affair, just in a kind of a brief a Cliff Notes version, uh, William Morgan, uh, Captain William Morgan, was going to expose the fraternity and break his oaths. He was a Mason, so some of his brothers uh, took him out and killed him. And there was a subsequent trial. The jurors and the judge were Masons, and they were all acquitted. The murderers were acquitted. Uh, so this caused a national scandal. This was happening right in Joseph's backyard, and as it happened, Joseph actually married William Morgan's uh, widow as one of his plural wives. So uh, there's an interesting connection there that many are not aware of. Exactly what Joseph Smith knew about the specifics of the ritual of Freemasonry and when he came to know these details is a debated question. The evidence suggests that the prophet did not take an institutional interest in Freemasonry until his Nauvoo, Illinois period, which was 1839 to 1844, when he became personally acquainted with Judge James Adams. The judge was a prominent citizen of Springfield, Illinois, Worshipful Master of the Springfield Lodge when it was founded in October 1839, and Right Worshipful Deputy Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Illinois, which was founded in 1840. On October 15, 1841, a dispensation was granted to charter a lodge in Nauvoo. On March 15, 1842, the Illinois Grand Master Jonas installed the lodge officers and made Joseph Smith a mason on site. Now, if we read many of the uh, traditional landmarks of Freemasonry, one of the prerogatives of a Grand Master is making a Mason on site. It doesn't mean he's automatically a Master Mason, but what it means is he can bypass all the time restrictions and can be initiated immediately. Texas has bypassed the landmark, if we want to call it one, and actually prohibited the Grand Master from making Masons on site. But many jurisdictions around the world still uh, have this as a prerogative of a Grand Master, and Joseph Smith was actually made a Mason on site. He said, and he wrote, quote, In the evening I received the first degree of free, in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge assembled in my general business office. End quote. In the LDS Church's History of the Church, Volume 4, page 552, the entry reads, quote, I was, I was in the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. It is worth noting that the Grand Master Jonas was running for a seat in the Illinois legislature 
making the theocratic leader of the second largest city in Illinois, second only to Chicago, would be a powerful addition to his political backers. So he figured that you have 30,000 voters in the second largest city that's, uh, that really are um, highly hierarchical and would vote in lockstep with church leaders, so making them an ally made sense. So there might have been a political motivation for chartering the lodge in Nauvoo, but also making Joseph a mason on site. By June 1842, all the members of the church's first presidency and quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the two highest governing bodies of the church, have become Freemasons. So there was an immediate interest by the church leadership at the time to become Freemasons. So what we have an image of here is a picture of what, if you visit Nauvoo, there will be a sign out front of this building that says the Cultural Hall. And I actually was able to give a tour to the tour guides and actually explain them what this building actually was. Because most of the uh, church's tour guides aren't aware that this building was actually used as a Masonic Lodge. Um, they'll tell you about the plays that were held on the bottom floor and so forth, but they won't tell you or, or they aren't actually are aware of the Masonic connections with it. And so uh, what we have here on the first floor, there was actually room for plays and social functions. But on the second and third floors, there were Masonic usages. And um, you can actually go there today. There's actually a door for the ante room and so forth. So it clearly had a Masonic context, and it was the building uh, still stands today for a Masonic use. And I've, I've dreamed about holding a lodge there. I just need to convince a Illinois lodge to, uh, to, to open lodge there and get permission from the, from the <coughs> church. But I don't know if uh, that will happen anytime soon. Okay, so Joseph had his own apron. And uh, do you all recognize what I'm wearing and why I'm wearing an apron in an open meeting? This is actually the replica. I didn't know I was going to be bringing it tonight. But uh, Brother Danny De Hoyas, brother of Arturo De Hoyas, both of which are um, uh, non-active members of the church, uh, lives in uh, near Allen. And Danny, when he heard I was giving this lecture, volunteered a couple items to me and piece of information. And so um, I'm actually going, and I was excited to be able to wear the replica apron, Joseph Smith's apron. So, you know, familiar symbols on it. Um, this is actually the real uh, historic apron and then the copy, which I'm wearing. Um, it shows the, you know, two columns, uh, many Masonic symbols that we're familiar with through our rituals. So the prophet took enough interest in it to uh, have his own apron made. So let me go back real quick to this. So soon after Joseph went through the initiation and became a Master Mason, uh, he developed or was revealed to him, however you wish to uh, phrase it, um, a, the ritual that we talk about in the temple, which is called the endowment. And it's the primary, um, it's one of the primary rituals that are conducted in the temple, but it's the one that actually has the connection with Freemasonry. So soon after he was initiated as a, a Mason, made a Master Mason, he revealed and came forth with the idea of a endowment ceremony. So following the prophet's initiation, one Latter-day Saint leader commented that, quote, many have joined the Masonic institution. This seems to be been a stepping stone, a preparation for something else, the true origin of Masonry, end quote, i.e. in the ancient priesthood or ordinances, such as in the temple. One aspect of this preparation apparently had to do with a general idea of respecting covenants or confidentiality, which, as we know, is one of the chief aims of, of our craft, is learning how to keep secrets and so forth. For example, Joseph Smith once told the saints that, quote, the reason we do not have the secrets of the Lord revealed to us is because we do not keep them. So he was emphasizing, again, this principle of confidentiality. He later observed, the secret of masonry is to keep a secret. Joseph may have seen the secret keeping of masonry as a tool to prepare the saints to respect the temple ordinances that he was soon to reveal to them. Six weeks after the prophet was made a mason on site, he gave an endowment to nine prominent Latter-day Saints, some Masons, in the upper floor of his storehouse. These nine Latter-day Saints were given new theological and ritual instructions. Note, the number nine is a prominent number to Royal Arch Mason. So maybe he selected the numbers, maybe it was just coincidence, but there was another added connection between uh, his uh, initiation into this new endowment ritual that Latter-day Saints practice this day, and Freemasonry. Statements made by Joseph Smith and early saints provide evidence of their belief that the endowment in Freemasonry in part emanated from the same ancient spring. And at least some similarities could be thought as remnants from an ancient original. Some believe that Freemasonry, as, it, as at present, was the, in an apostate endowment, as sectarian religion was the apostate religion. 
However, if the prophet viewed it as an apostate priesthood, he did nothing to suppress it, but rather encouraged it. Quote, he was aware that there were some things up masonry which he had come down from the beginning, and he desired to know what they were. Hence, the lodge was established in Nauvoo. And I believe that was William Clayton, uh, another prominent church member, was discussing this principle about the connection. Automatically, they understood if they were already masons, they went through another ritual that was similar, they would have been aware of that connection from the on onset. <clears throat> the first Latter-day Saint masons, given the endowment, would have been introduced to specific ritual terms, language, and gestures as well as a larger patterns, such as those involving repetition and the use of questions and answers as the aid to teaching. Masons who have received the higher degree initiations, particularly the York Rite, would have noticed other similarities, such as washings and anointings, passing through veils to re-enter the presence of God, priestly clothing, etc. So the temple, the first place that uh, Joseph, there was actually a temple pre uh, preceding the Nauvoo Temple. This is a uh, rebuilt uh, temple in Nauvoo, Illinois. The original was destroyed. Um, there was one temple that preceded in Kirtland, but it was in this temple, in this location, where the endowment uh, was first practiced in mass. Uh, Joseph gave the first endowments in his store, but they later uh, retrofitted the temple under construction and started giving this endowment in mass. And it caused a lot of problems because he was initiating both men and women into what many saw as Masonic ordinances. So Im immediately there was some consternation uh, politically with Grand Lodge in Illinois and so forth that they were given uh, inclination that he was making Masons um, and that he was initiating actually women. But this is actually a building in Nauvoo, Illinois. This was uh, construction in the year 2000. Uh, the original uh, temple in Nauvoo was burned to the ground. And it is an exact replica. Um, they actually hired artisans from the same location to uh, reconstruct it. Um, the only difference is, I believe, it was moved 10 feet to the west uh, because they needed to accommodate ADA-compliant uh, ramps for handicapped individuals. But it's almost on the exact spot. And I, I visited it. It's a, a beautiful temple. Well, as I said, Joseph started making enemies. Uh, the church had had many enemies throughout its history for a number of reasons. Some our own fault, some not our fault. But on June 27, 1844, Joseph was killed. He was summoned uh, to a trial uh, to face arrest, indictment, in Carthage, Illinois. And he and his brother and two other associates, or maybe it was three, uh, they journeyed. Uh, and there's actually a statue in Nauvoo of them turning back around. They had a moment to escape. But instead they decided, uh, no, we'll face our fate in Carthage. They went to the jail, they uh, sang hymns and prayed, um, but that day, uh, a, a mob with their faces painted black uh, stormed the uh, jail and actually killed Joseph, his brother, wounded one other associate, and one was uh, kept uh, safe. But in, our, in one of our books of scripture, we have an account of this. To seal the testimony of this book in the Book of Mormon, we announced that the martyrdom of Joseph Smith the prophet and Hiram, Hiram Smith the patriarch they, will sh they were shot in Carthage jail on the 27th of June, 1844, about 5 o'clock p.m. by an armed mob painted black of 150 to 200 persons. Hiram was shot first and fell calmly, exclaiming, I am a dead man. Joseph leaped from the window and was shot dead in the attempt, exclaiming, O Lord my God. <clears throat> they were both shot after they were dead in a brutal manner and both received four balls. Many of the Masons that had been at the chartering of Nauvoo Lodge, had been Joseph's brothers, were in the mob itself. And his exclamation means something to those of us in the know. Oh, Lord, my God, wasn't just a prayer to heaven. He knew the men in the crowd. And he was exclaiming to them as well, uh, stop. And so this is a fact that's escaped by non-Masons and also members of the church that don't understand what was going on. But clearly he recognized who was, who were his killers, just like uh, William Morgan that there, was a, there were Mason culprits at work. Okay, so this is kind of an aside, and um, I added this uh, slide in. I thought it's not necessarily Masonic, but it is esoteric. And when Joseph was martyred, one of the items that was found on his body and actually cat cataloged was a Jupiter talisman. Now, Brother De Hoyas, in addition to my apron, actually presented and allowed me to bring a replica of Joseph's Jupiter talisman. Uh, Joseph the prophet, um, there is some evidence between he and his brother Hiram 
that they were involved in esoterics, Kabbal, Kabbal, the Kabbalah and so forth. Um, they had books in their collection such as Barrett's The Magus, which had to deal with ceremonial magic and so forth. And uh, it's interesting, one of this, uh, the talisman that was worn by Joseph, and there's diary entries to the fact that he always wore it, even though some apologists uh, will say that uh, there's no evidence, or there's only scan evidence that he actually owned it. Um, there are documents linking this directly to him, and I'm going to pass it around. I just need to make sure I get it back, because Brother Du Bois didn't want to upset him. He was kind <laughs> enough. But um, Joseph was clearly interested in more just than Freemasonry. And he was uh, venturing outward in many different uh, angles, esoterics, the Kabbalah, and so forth. So I like to speculate he would have been at home in the Scottish Rite, perhaps, had he lived longer. Um, but I'm going to pass it around. I'm going to start over here. And when it gets over to this brother by the door, um, just bring it back. That's okay. Y'all can check it out and handle it uh, while we're discussing. Um, but these symbols here would have uh, been common. Uh, Joseph was born with Jupiter as the reigning planet. Um, in the house uh, when he was born. Um, there are astrological connections and also uh, the time period in the 1830s, uh, specific, specifically on the frontier of the American West, um, folk magic was very common. It wasn't uh, thought of as something or divinatory devices. They weren't necessarily thought of as something taboo. Um, this is a later development. If you look at early Christianity, there were, um, particularly the first 400 years, astrology was something that was well, widely accepted until the medieval period. And then there was a uh, move, move away from that. Let's put it that way. But um, he had this on his person. Hiram, his brother, also killed, uh, had magical parchments um, such as this. Um, these are in private collections. Um, he, there are three of these that were, uh, and this is colored. The, the other ones are not uh, colorized in the same fashion, but this is clear. And on the edge, you can read here, holiness to the Lord on three sides. Um, that inscription is above every one of our temples. Um, so there's a connection between the temple and this magical parchment as well. You can find these online. Well, soon after Joseph died, the, the saints had a real issue. Who is to succeed Joseph? And we're being forced out of our homes once again. The majority of the church followed the 12 apostles with Brigham Young and its head. He wasn't declared prophet immediately, but they followed their leadership. There were other groups that formed, some of which exist to this day, uh, one of which was led by Joseph Smith's son, uh, Joseph Smith III, later in the 1860s. Uh, he took the helm of that group. But the majority followed the 12 apostles, uh, Brigham Young at its head, westward. And instead of going to Texas, they decided they were going to leave the U.S. for good, and they were going to travel to the Salt Lake Basin. Uh, it was land no one wanted. It was desolate. There were enough water supply for creative farmers and so forth to have agricultural schemes to make it flourish. It had high mountains around all the sides with one or two passes leading into it. It was easily defendable, um, but they decided this was the land that we're going to make um, home and turn it into uh, what we call Zion. But this is a, a painting. You can see the temple out of the background uh, crossing the Mississippi River and then, of course, uh, the frozen Mississippi River and then traveling across the plains towards Utah. So this is an image of the Mormon Trail, 1830-1851. And... Uh, what we have here, the proposed state of Deseret, uh, Brigham actually proposed uh, that the U.S. government create this massive state called Deseret that uh, he would lead. And it was rejected, um, but later a territory for the church, de facto territory for the church called the Territory of Utah was carved out of this. Uh, the centerpiece being, um, and you can see right here, Utah Territory, 1847. It was a large piece of land which included modern day uh, Nevada as well. And this is an image, a painting of uh, Brigham Young. Uh, he was ill when he went into the Salt Lake Valley, but once he entered the Salt Lake Valley, uh, he had, one of the first things he did was decide a location to establish a temple to continue the endowment rituals that had been uh, first birthed by Joseph Smith in Nauvoo. And the, there's a famous uh, exclamation, this is the spot. And there's actually a monument to it as well. But the Salt Lake Temple was not the first to be built in Utah. The very first temple to continue the endowment practices, which I've already mentioned had a connection with Freemasonry, uh, was the St. George Temple. And it is the oldest operational temple um, that my church has to this day. It was, I believe, dedicated in 1870. It's in southern Utah where uh, cotton was being grown. And in, this was the only temple for around 20 years. 
um, or 10 or 15 to 20 years. There were several other pioneer, what are called pioneer temples that were built, but this was the very first. And you can see it looks like almost like a castle, right? Um, it has these like fortifications to kind of show that it's uh, warding off outward evil influences and so forth. Currently, we have 161 dedicated temples dotting the globe, 12 are under construction, and 28 are announced. So this um, endowment, it's one, like I said, one of the several rituals that are conducted in our temples are being uh, given worldwide. So what goes on in a temple? And this is uh, kind of where I want to get into the actual endowment itself, because we talked about some of these tacit connections, but I want to go into some more detail here, okay? And are y'all following me? Are we good? Okay, making sure. So I'm going to ask a question. Who can tell me what this is an image of? Okay, brother? I, I cheat. It's basically uh, inside of the tabernacle. Okay. And so it's basically the high priests who are, are, who are being ordained. Well, who, which, which high priest? That would have been, that was uh, Aaron. Aaron. Aaron, okay. And who's ordaining him? Moses. Moses, okay. So I want to, let's talk about something else. When a king or queen, when the queen of England, right, Elizabeth, when she was crown coronated king of Israel, or king of Israel, crown, crown <laughs> queen of the United Kingdom, what was one of the things that they do to make her queen? Like, what are some of the rites of coronation? They put a crown on her head. Well, they put a crown on her head. Before they put a crown on her head, what did she they She was do? anointed with holy oil. She's yes. anointed with chrism, okay? Why? Because it's a, rich, it's a, a religious rite in addition. The rite of kingship is also a rite of a religious rite. Okay, we look at da uh, David being anointed with oil and so forth. There's a common connection between priesthood and kingship. So when we talk about the rights of kingship, we're also talking about the rights of priesthood anointings. And in the temple, uh, part of what goes on is we're actually anointed, washed and clean and anointed to become uh, kings and queens to the Most High God, to rule and reign in the house of Israel forever. And that's a quote. Um, so uh, it goes back, and the connection, at least theologically, would be to the Old Testament and the rights of kingship and priesthood connections. Temple government. So this is not an illicit photo, brother. Oh. No, but this is actually a photo the church put out, and um, I, uh, there, you don't see any of anything on them besides they look like a white t-shirt and underwear, but uh, part of what uh, goes on in the temple and part of what we do uh, is we are given, and we start wearing once you go through the temple the first time, uh, what are called temple garments, okay? And the church, because there was a lot of speculation and rumors about what the, the holy underwear, or holy Mormon underwear, or whatever you want to call it, look like, uh, they actually put out a uh, press photo of it. Um, sand some um, more confidential aspects of it. But this is what temple garments look like. They're, they're real uh, crazy, aren't they, right? Just uh, <laughs> white t-shirts and shorts. But there's a reason why we wear them. And there's two reasons, one of which goes back to the temple. And thou shalt make them linen breeches, that is Aaron and his sons, to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even to the thigh, they shall reach. Exodus 28, 20, 42. There's also one other connection. Unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. So this is why Latter-day Saints wear temple garments, okay? But it goes somewhat to the temple as one of the connections. We also have another image, press image, the church put out of our temple robes. Um, most of the time, you ask most Latter-day Saints, I don't even know if they know that this image is online, but it's on the church newsroom's uh, website. Uh, they actually put out a press statement. Again, the description of what these items are, are not given, because that's esoteric, confidential, right? But the image is here. So these are uh, temple clothing. This is uh, part of the ritual regalia that we wear in the temple. Its connection goes back to Exodus as well. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which I shall make, a breastplate and an ephod, a robe, an embroidered coat, a mitre and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron and thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So how many of y'all are your Christ Masons? Okay. Does any of this sound familiar? I mean, somewhat, right? Some of these connections are there as well. So, but when you go through the temple, and I'm going to go actually go through the ritual itself somewhat, uh, you, you go through a, a ritual, now there's the Masonic context and connection, what I talked about, words and gestures and repetition and so forth, 
But the actual storyline is not the building of King Solomon's temple. It's Adam and Eve and their journey from the fall back to the presence of God. And you start out in the very first place, which is the creation room. A room that represents the creation of the world. And again, all these photos are uh, from the church. They're not illicitly taken. The next is the garden room. You enter the Garden of Eden, and you learn about the story of the Garden of Eden presented in dramatic fashion. But then there's the fall, and you actually enter the world room. And in each of these rooms, different aspects and ritual uh, functions take place. But then as you return upward, now we talk about uh, you know, going upward, right? One, three, five, seven, or one, two, three, right? You go upward as you ascend the mountain of initiation and so forth. The same function is the same in the temple. In some temples, you actually start at the basement and work your way up to the top of the room, okay, like Salt Lake Temple. But after you leave the world, and you leave the terrestrial world, you actually enter the, or telestial world, you enter the terrestrial world. It's brighter, it's brighter, or it's brighter, it's lighter. Um, it's, it has some color, but it's mostly white, and it represents a higher level of uh, attainment, glory, exaltation, and so forth. But finally, you enter the celestial room. And the celestial room represents that highest aspect of uh, heaven that we, we profess to believe in. Um, this is a picture of the San Antonio Temple. Um, you have the uh, Tree of Life in the background and so forth. And uh, in this room, uh, no ritual actions take place. It's the final phase of uh, progression and so forth. So, let's talk about the Masonic connection. I went through that just so you have a glimpse into our world. I cannot violate my Masonic oaths or temple covenants, so I will keep the similarities vague. However, symbolic gestures, <clears throat> altars, progressive layout of initiation, wording, confidentiality, a card to gain admission, and this may be just a modern contrivance or similarity, but you actually have a barcoded card when you walk up to the uh, desk. They scan it in to make sure you're able to enter the temple, just like we have dues cards. <laughs> among other similarities. However, the general narrative, purpose, the mission of women, majority of wording, specific words, tokens, and signs are not the same as in the Masonic ritual. So there's some similarities, but there are other differences. Now, this is Brigham Young. Can you all see what he's wearing? Right here? Square and compass. He was a proud Mason. He was the second president of the church, succeeded Joseph, um, formulated the endowment as we have it today in, in many, because Joseph had a very rudimentary, uh, rudimentary endowment. Uh, Brigham's the one that really um, focused it and, and streamlined it and made it into this uh, formulaic ritual that we have today. Um, but he was also a Freemason and a very avid one. And because of the conflicts between uh, Brigham, he had a very, uh, he was a very, he had a big personality, okay, let's say, to say the least. Uh, he liked to throw his weight around. Um, it was his way or the highway. Um, it was a tough world. I mean, it was uh, the frontier and a desert. And uh, the past 20 years, the church had been under assault. So it took a guy like him to kind of keep things together. But because of his personality, disagreements developed between himself and other Masons that were moving into the Utah Territory that were not members of the church. Uh, they feared that if lodges were built in Utah Territory, that they would be taken over um, by these clandestine Masons called Mormons. Because their temple rituals were stolen from Masonic rituals, so they're clandestine Masons, they admit women, and they're going to take over our lodges and so forth. So, early in the Utah Grand Lodge history, uh, a decision was made to ban Latter-day Saints from being Masons in the Territory. Um, I believe it's the only such prohibition of a certain religious group uh, from any Grand Lodge. Can anyone name any other that you know about? I mean, they're, they're, the Swedish Grand Lodges require you to be a Trinitarian Christian, but that's a requirement to join. Not, you are a member of this church, you can't join. So, a lot of it had to do with Brigham, his personality, and so forth. Because of the similarities between the endowment and Masonic ritual, the Grand Lodge of Utah prohibited Latter-day Saints from becoming Masons within its jurisdiction or joining its lodges. This prohibition was based, not, based on the political climate of 19th century Utah, where non-Latter-day Saints were at odds with member, the member majority. However, this prohibition was rescinded in 1984. The current Grand Master of Utah and the majority of Masons in Utah are Latter-day Saints. 
So the final conquest took, a, took effect. So it just took, took a, a little over 100 years. Um, but uh, yeah, 1984, it's pretty, pretty recent. And uh, as a consequence of this, uh, the Utah Grand Lodge is actually the second smallest Grand Lodge in North America. Um, there were only, I think, about 1,500 Masons in the state of Utah. Uh, because when you exclude 80% of the population, you're probably not going to have many people to join. However, it is a beautiful Grand Lodge building. And um, I'm actually going to go visit first time in March. The current mo most worshipful Grand Master of Utah is Lorenzo E. Tibbetts, uh -huh. uh, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and now Grand Master. So, as I said, turn of events, change of events, from being banned to actually leading the organization. So, here is my interpretation, okay? We talked a lot. We had the context, the historical connections. We talked about Joseph Smith and his family with Freemasonry and his connection with esoteric practices and so forth. Uh, we talked about the uh, being made a Mason on site in Nauvoo, Illinois, and the connections between the endowment ritual and Freemasonic ritual, uh, also the history of Freemasonry and so forth. Um, I want to give you my interpretation of how these things intersect, okay? Maybe bring it all together. Freemasonry was developed in medieval Euro European stonemasons' guilds. It absorbed a variety of ritual elements, some of which come from antiquity and possibly the Middle East. During the Enlightenment, philosophical elements were added, which resulted in the modern fraternity. Uh, Revolutionary Brotherhood is a good primer on this subject. Um, that it was in the early 1700s, Isaac Newton's circle and so forth started uh, finding a convenient model of initiation and added to it um, this substratum of Enlightenment uh, philosophy, simplicity, brotherhood, and so forth. Um, but that's kind of the historic trajectory that we know about today. We can speculate on Knights Templar and Egyptian UFOs and the like, um, but as far as the historic data that we have, this is the story that I believe and probably most historians would agree as the basis of our fraternity. Joseph Smith and his contemporaries believed in the ancient origin of the craft. He may have seen Freemasonry as holding forms of the original Jewish temple rites. However, given the vast majority of Masonic ritual was not included in the endowment, and Freemasonry continued to thrive in both Nauvoo and Utah, it seemed unlikely that he took its ancient origins too seriously. I believe that Joseph Smith saw Freemasonry as a worthwhile system of morality and symbolism. Freemasonry would also be an advantage to himself and followers who had been persecuted for the past 14 years. The prophet knew that the majority of Latter-day Saints were familiar with the craft, and using its ritual formulas would enable revealed truths to be more easily assimilated. So in other words, I, I, like as I said, I don't accept the antiquity thesis of Freemasonry. I think it probably is a mid, uh, medieval stonemason's uh, development, okay, and came from the, that period, 1100, 1200, AD, around that time. Um, but I think Joseph Smith saw it as a convenient framework to co uh, convey certain truths through symbolic format, that it had efficacy. He saw it in the life of his brother, he saw it in the life of his father and his contemporaries, and adapted and used um, some of its forms and so forth uh, in the context of his church. So, again, this is a picture of the Salt Lake Temple. We began our discussion with a picture of it. I mentioned Temple Square. Uh, there was actually a wall around it, which, um, you know, is the outer court, so to speak, um, to replicate um, the Israelite temple. You have um, some kind of church administrative buildings and so forth. You enter in on the right. There's that uh, raised building in the portion you see that on the right hand side of the, the main temple. Um, that's actually where you enter in, you go through the basement, and then you actually go through uh, the temple itself. And uh, an interesting aside, um, the Salt Lake Temple is unique because it contains a Holy of Holies. Um, it is the only LDS temple, um, Latter-day Saint temple, that actually has a Holy of Holies. Uh, most members are not aware of this. It's mentioned some in our manuals, but um, there were 1930s pictures that were taken by the church um, that uh, reveal some of these, the, the aspect of it and what it is, but it actually has the Holy of Holies within it. Um, one of the other temples has one that was converted into a, uh, a wedding room, a ceiling room, but unique temple. On the temple, though, we have familiar Masonic symbols, symbols that are maybe familiar to us. Clasp hands, right? Very familiar Masonic symbol. Could be just showing brotherly love and affection, but it has a Masonic connection as well. You all see an eye engraved on the temple above the, uh, the doors, the east doors. On the Nauvoo temple, we have morning star symbols or inverted pentagrams. 
um, familiar to us from the Eastern Star. Okay? Beehive on the doorknobs to the temple. I mean, it's a Masonic symbol, right? It shows industry and so forth. And then finally, an image of what's called a sunstone, which was the uh, ca uh, capital, the top of the columns around the Nauvoo Temple. Um, there were these sunstones. At the uh, Salt Lake Temple, there are sun, moon, and stars as well. So there's also these type of, like I said, similarities and connections. But that's the end of my presentation. I don't think I have any more slides. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to present. <laughs> I hope you have questions though, right? I mean, does anyone have any questions? I'd love to answer them. Any questions? Yes, sir. So, is the official stance of the church yeah. that the endowment is inspired by Masonic ritual, or is the official stance of the church that they have similarities because of their origins? I don't think it's either. Um, there's a recent publication by the church called Saints. It's actually a like a historical novel, and in it there's a reference, one page reference to uh, the, the Freemason the context and so forth. Um, but I don't know if there is an actual official statement of why there's similarities. Um, I think maybe, like I said, the lab, my interpretation might be the more mainstream one at this point, that there's similarities because uh, Joseph saw a convenient framework and adapted it to his own purpose. So even though it wasn't masonry, um, there were these similarities because it's a great way of teaching people moral lessons and truths. So um, to that point, there is an acknowledgement of the historic connection between Freemasonry and uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but in terms of why the endowment has similarities, you have to also remember this. I would venture to say probably not a single one of our church leadership are Masons. So unless you're a Mason, you wouldn't recognize some of the similarities on, on the outset, right? So, I mean, that might be an answer in and of itself, too. Anyone else, sir? I don't have a question, but I do need to make a comment. Uh, before you ask any questions, brothers, remember there are two, members, two people here that are not Masons. One of them has been a past and is going to receive his degrees this weekend. And the other one is under investigation right now. So be careful how you frame your question, okay? That's number one. Now, for those two people, if you don't mind, correct me if I'm wrong. This is an open meeting. In masonry, you can talk about things like this. In a tile meeting, we're right on the edge of violating Grand Lodge law, speaking about any particular religion or any secular type of political involvement. So that's for the two people who are not yet masons. So there's a difference between what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing in a tile meeting. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and to that point, yeah, there's uh, kind of this general concept of no politics, religion, and lodge. Um, and you have to be very careful where you, you don't get in theological debates. That's why I tried to keep it on history somewhat. I mean, I said you have to talk about some of the doctrine, but it's probably more appropriate to do an open meeting. However, there's a lot of religion, Sufism, Jewish Kabbalah, right? Um, there's a, a Judaism. There's a lot of connections between different religions and our fraternity. So that's why this is probably a great time to do it. Anyway, brother here, you had a question. Is there any evidence to suggest that either Joseph Smith or Brigham Young uh, went through the Royal Arch, for example, mm -hmm. or, or anything along those lines? Joseph wasn't a York Rite Mason. I'm not positive about Brigham, um, but uh, I don't believe I don't believe Joseph was, and I don't know about his brothers either. But you know, there, you can probably see why the, that question would be appropriate. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes, sir. Is the Church of the Latter Day Saints a church that you just you just can't walk off the street and come in and worship? No, you absolutely can. You can. Okay. Yeah. The All temple, right. you can. But the temple, like, we, we have a bifurcated, like, if you go to our normal meeting house, which you see all around town, right, that's very low church. You, it, it feels like a congregational worship because most of the saints were Yankees, right? Um, that's why Utah is the only area in the western U.S. that's mostly English because they all came from New England, Vermont, and New Hampshire, and so forth. Look at, a, look at a demographic map of ancestry by county. 
there's like a bunch of Germans and then this big <laughs> island of Englishmen and it's Utah uh, because that's where their ancestry came from. Um, so our worship services or what we call sacrament meetings uh, reflect and have a, a, a similar feel to say congregational worship in New England. Um, however, the temple is, I would consider, a high church function, right? There's no incense, but it's very liturgical. So our temples are kind of off limits to non, not even just non-members. Uh, you have to be a worthy member to go into a temple. Um, however, our meeting houses are free and open to anyone who wants to, to visit. I, I'm not sure I understand the difference. And do they do they meet like every, both meet on a Sunday or? No. Um, okay, so let me clarify, okay? So um, we have meeting houses, which is where normal worship takes place, like your everyday church service, which looks, you know, like I said, like you could go in and walk in and you're probably going to hear things theologically that might be different than what you're used to. However, it is a very familiar hymns are sung, <clears throat> Sunday school classes are given. There, there are dozens of them in the Metroplex, right? Okay. There's only one temple in Dallas. The temple is a separate type of building. It is a, uh, it, it is a sacred structure. It's like the difference between the temple and the synagogue. There's this, there's a Okay, there's a but difference. what is the service in the temple as differentiated from a common worship service? And that's what I was going over, those rooms you go through in the yeah. endowment. Um, those are, that would be what you would see in a temple. Um, now, some temples have fewer rooms. They're condensed, like multiple of those rooms are condensed into one room or two. Um, but... Uh, the temple is used for uh, certain ordinances. There's no worship services there. There's no um, uh, big meetings for the most part that are held in them. It's you go there to do to be married in a temple, to uh, be baptized for deceased persons, to go through the endowment ritual, and so forth. But normal and and they're actually closed on Sundays. So you have to go to your church on Sunday, but then you go to a temple, you can go during the week. So does every church member go through the endowment service? Well, ideally, okay. but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yes, yeah. So you have to, um, as a, a man, you have to uh, be at least 18 years old and have what's called the Melchizedek priesthood, which is a, um, like, we, we've heard the term priesthood of all believers, correct? Like Protestants have the term priesthood of all believers. Um, in, in a sense, and then you have Catholics that have this defined clergy that are ordained through apostolic succession. Mormons kind of merge the two, uh, two concepts into one. Um, in the sense, we do believe in a literal ordination, in <clears throat> apostolic succession, but every man virtually has the ordination. Okay, And so to go through the temple as a man, you have to receive ordination, and then um, go through a worthiness interview with your bishop, um, which is like a pastor. You'd sit down with him, and he asks you certain questions about you know, your uh, moral standing and whether you pay tithes and so forth. And then at that point, you know, you jump through one or two hoops, you get a card and you can go take out your endowments and go, go through the ritual and be initiated. Most women, women can either go in at 18, they don't have to be ordained because they're not ordained in my church, but, um, or they wait till they get married. And that's very common as well, that they get married. And right before they get married, they actually go through the, the endowment ritual. So, yes, sir. So, did polygamy ever cause any friction between the church and Freemasonry? I would assume so. Yeah, I, I don't. I like. I haven't delved into the politics. I'm. I mean, it'd be a great question for me to ask when I'm in Utah in, in March. Um, and I know your subject matter about the Klan and Freemasonry. And that I would assume yes, because what you had it, uh, in Utah, particularly in the 1860s, was uh, the gold rush in California. You had silver rushes. Um, so plenty of non-Mormons were moving into Utah in addition to the members of the church that formed the majority population. So I would think that, yes, polygamy, of course, was a, a point of contention. Um, James Garfield, in his inaugural address, uh, talked about the twin pillars of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. And James Garfield, the Civil War general, and, uh, slavery had already been eradicated, so everyone knew exactly who his target was. And soon after, uh, the federal government actually passed a, a piece of legislation that if you were an organization that sponsored polygamy, uh, you couldn't exist as a corporate entity, you couldn't have assets. Um, there was only one organization that practiced polygamy, or plural marriage at the time. So the church actually had its corporate status uh, revoked. Uh, most of its leaders were put in jail or had to go on the run. And um, uh, this is where you had this trend of breaking apart families, polygamous families. Um, soon after that, we had a, um, a statement about the impracticality of continuing to be or to practice poor marriage, and that was in the 1890s, I believe. 
So, uh, 1893. 1893? Okay. I'm not. No, uh, clarify, make sure, you know, everyone knows. You know, Brother Kaysen is actually very well versed in this, wrote a thesis on the, the topic, so. Um, yes, sir? Is there, a, um, a, like, a time limit between the endowments, like, for you have, or, you know, you can't do them all in one day, or, or I mean, you could, you hear it, but, I mean, is there a, is, how closely does it match to that pattern? Sure. Um, like what? What when you uh, an endowment? The endowment is like a, it's it's a hour and a half, two hour kind of thing. Yeah. That you do. Um, you can go do them all. There. You know, as long as the temple's open, you can go to multiple in a day or a week or a month. I mean, it's it's up to you. Um, you only go once for yourself, and then you go other times for uh, deceased persons, uh, proxy proxy endowments. So you would either go through one of your own ancestors or. Um, which is ideal, or if you don't have you know, genealogical research done for you, you can go and they'll give you a name or someone. And so I've done them for people from the 1500s or 1600s and so forth and have to pronounce like weird German names or complicated stuff. So, um, Any other questions? Yes, sir. Would you be surprised if I didn't raise my hand back? No, please. Yeah, I thought, well, I, just for disclosure, I'm an ordained Trinitarian minister, so just for clarity there. I'd like to address uh, the brother's question. I don't, I don't believe there was any conflict between the church and Freemasonry. No. There, there was wasn't. a conflict between the church and the United States. Correct. In, insofar as plagiarism states. And um, the LDS, Mormons at the time, forgive me if I use that term. I it's fine. I'm not most accustomed to. Um, it, it was necessary for there to be a renouncement of polygamy in order for Utah to become a state of the union. Which is true. So, so there was a conflict there, but I don't I don't remember that Freemasonry had any conflict per se. Um, well, it, I think his point was, is uh, did the Grand Lodge of Utah when it was there, was that one of the reasons they didn't want to admit Masons? And I, I don't know if it was. But to your point, yes, there was, There's a, there were three wars fought amongst the federal government against uh, uh, members of my church. There was the Missouri Mormon War, where massacres happened, actually. Um, Hans Mill Massacre being a particular one. Uh, women and children were killed. Illinois Mormon War, where you had the Siege of Nauvoo and so forth. And then you had the Utah Mormon War, which happened right before the war between the states. And an interesting story about that is, um, I believe one third of the U.S. Army was dis dispatched under Albert Sidney Johnson to uh, basically enforce um, the, the laws, the federal laws in the territory of Utah. Um, and uh, Brigham Young actually had fortified the passes, they covered up what the temple was, um, they had uh, deployed the Nauvoo Legion in the passes to cut down the federal troops as they marched through because they were only in a defensive position. They harassed the uh, soldiers as they came in and so forth. It was a, a true state of um, armed conflict, an armed camp had set in. Um, the, the saving grace, so to speak, was uh, Fort Sumter. And when Fort Sumter and the Civil War began, all the federal troops were recalled from Utah. And there are actual dispatches between Abraham Lincoln and Brigham Young, uh, where Abraham Lincoln actually had a quote that says, uh, tell President Young, if he leaves me alone, I'll leave him alone. Because the worst thing that the Union government was thinking is now we're going to have this insurrection happening out in the West, and we're going to have to send troops uh, to fight the, the Mormons rather than fighting the Confederates. So um, all similar time period, and, and to that point, the, the church sat out uh, the Civil War for the most part. Yeah, I, I do. I want to. Uh, I do have a question, but I want to provide some clarity to my brother that earlier said that we might be treading on thin Grand Lodge ice. You know, when you and I first talked, that was my concern. You and I had a chat about that. Sure. I I don't I don't agree with my brother. I respect his opinion, but I think that we're on solid ground insofar as there has not been any proselytizing any encouragement or discouragement toward or against Trinitarian or non-Trinitarian face one way or the other. Well, I got some missionaries coming to your house later, so don't well, <laughs> if you want me, If you want me to get into it with your missionaries on Doctrine and Covenants 132, and uh, I'll be happy to. I, I keep the missionaries around quite a bit when they come. But um, one thing I think you might be able to add that I think is interesting yeah. is that when Brigham left Nauvoo. He did not know what his ultimate destination was, but he ultimately stopped there. And maybe you could provide the history as to that sure. and how it reflects the state bird of Utah, which I think most of these folks might find interesting. Well, okay, let me, let me, uh, so, uh, yes, the seagull. Right? Yes, okay. which is an odd okay. state okay. bird. Okay, okay, especially for Utah. 
Um, so when, remember in the beginning of my lecture, I talk about the two Masons, Sam Houston and Joseph Smith. There's a really interesting book by Texas, Texas A&M Press called The Texas Republic and the Mormon Kingdom of God. It's a great book, it's short, small, but it details this correspondence between Sam Houston and where they were going, and Joseph was debating whether it was going to be South Texas or East Texas and so forth. And as I mentioned, when he was killed, uh, that plan got scrapped uh, because Brigham said, you know, I like the idea of going to Texas, but it's a dangerous place. There's Mexican armies invading nonstop. We don't want to be in a war zone. Let's go out to Lando and want it. And there were several choices of where uh, the church was going to be planted, one of which was Oregon, Oregon Territory. Well, there was uh, some consternation between the British and the Russians and the U.S., so that was kind of uh, thought of as not particularly good. It was also good land. So what, what happens when you move to somewhere where there's good land? There's competition. And you don't want competition if you're this group that's been persecuted for the last 14 years. That was, uh, that was a, um, he actually sent forward expeditions, Brigham did. Uh, he was a, as Joseph was a uh, visionary kind of guy, right, a very charismatic, uh, Brigham was a planner and an organizer and a leader of men, right? He was a planner. So he actually sent forward parties out to establish irrigation channels, uh, to build streams so they could plant crops. He uh, had uh, sent farmers ahead of time to plant all the crops when the, the, the uh, main body of the church, 30,000 people, uh, reached it. Uh, there would already be food growing and so forth. He did know where they were going in terms of the Salt Lake Valley. But in terms of this is the spot, no, he didn't know until um, he actually arrived there. And that's the whole point. Um, and you brought up the seagulls. Um, this is a uh, piece of uh, Mormon lore, Utah lore. Um, the church was, like I said, they just were moving out there. They had just planted crops. And out of nowhere, a horde of locusts um, came out of nowhere. Tens of millions of locusts came out of nowhere and started devouring the, the crops. And this was going to uh, be a calamity uh, because you have all these tens of thousands of people that are coming out and they're on their way across the plains. And there's not going to be food for them because you're in a desert. Um, and so the story is, is out of nowhere, uh, flocks of seagulls came and ate all the locusts and saved all the crops. Um, and there's actually a seagull monument to it um, out of nowhere. So uh, we would say it's Providence, but others would say coincidence, but it was a good coincidence nonetheless. And, um, but it's an interesting, so the state bird of Utah is the seagull. Um, so any other questions? Anyone else? The seagull, we'll yeah. I've got two actually for you. Okay, two. What's the first? Um, and, and I don't mean to... He's, he's going to want you to stand up because it's, it's, yeah. if I'm uh, <laughs> violating anything, <coughs> I'll tell you, don't worry. Um, <laughs> is there any truth to the idea that there are Masonic a connection to the marks on the temple garments? I can't comment. Okay. And second, um, is there any Masonic connection to either of the orders of priesthood? Mm, that one I probably could maybe talk about. I, I don't know. Um, there's a there was an interesting article I read about when Joseph in 1844, um, right at the cusp of when he was right before he died, is when he had this flurry of creativity going on. I mean, this is like you know where most of our distinctive documents came from is in the last two years of his life. Um, and one interesting historical note was that, and this is actually called the Council of Fifty. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Council of Fifty before. But uh, there was the church, right, where Joseph functioned as the prophet. And then once the endowment started uh, functioning, he became the high priest of this anointed quorum. But then at the very end of his life, he formulated a political organization called the Kingdom of God, or the Council of Fifty. And he was crowned king of Israel. Uh, they actually had a coronation ceremony where he was crowned king of Israel. And that was the organization that started negotiating with Sam Houston. It wasn't the church negotiated. It was a political organization, a monarchy that wanted to establish an independent kingdom. So you had a prophet, a priest, and a king. And that might be a Masonic connection with the York Rite. That's, that's my speculation. Um, and when he actually, there was actually a, a historic, there was, there was a historic aside to this that he actually made a statement in effect that he had gone up the ladder to the position of king that the, the prophethood would transfer to his brother uh, Hiram. Um, now, I, don't, I haven't validated that, but there's an interesting kind of connection there to Masonry. Yes, sir. Thank you. I was just going to say that at the time of his death, Joseph Smith was also a candidate for President of the United States. Yes. And uh, here's the interesting fact about that as well, and maybe you could, uh, Brother Riley, correct? Right? Robert. 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 Yes, I keep, I'm going to, I'm going to. That's okay. 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 You can correct me because you might know, and Brother Kaysen as well. Uh, there was actually a path to the presidency, or at least to be a spoiler in the election. 
Um, you know, Joseph uh, was an extremely charismatic guy, his uh, uh, mid to late 30s, handsome dude. Um, you know, like I said, he was, he was the guy that, you know, people wanted to be like. This is why he was able to attract so many people to him. And he also had political ambitions. And so he was traveling and had sent the 12 apostles, actually at his death, they were around the country, uh, campaigning for him. And he was trying to f uh, formulate a centrist ticket. Because at this point, there, were, uh, there was a lot of conflict between Jacksonian Democrats and the Whigs. And so what Joseph saw was a path where he could actually um, almost broke it a brokered uh, presidency or uh, thought he could spoil it one or the, uh, the other. I think there's probably, and you might, you might uh, be interested in this if you haven't heard of this already, that he was giving the United States one more chance. He was saying, basically, you have one more chance to, re to, to repent, in other words, uh, before uh, judgment is brought upon you. So in a sense, there was this kind of aspect that he was running for president uh, in order to give one more chance, wash his hands of it, move out of the country, and let the, uh, you know, whatever judgment came upon them as well. And there's some evidence that that might have been his motivation as well. Um, any other questions? Yes, Brother Sugar. Thank you, Brother Lance. That was very informative. So you had mentioned uh, hymns. I was just curious, what are the sources of these hymns? Okay. Yeah, um, so uh, most, I don't know about the percentage, but most of our hymns are uh, Protestant hymns, um, common Protestant hymns. Um, you know, how great thou art, and come thou fount of every blessing, and so forth. Um, however, there's a large percentage that are our own hymns as well. Uh, from the pioneer period, come, come ye saints, and um, so forth. Uh, and then there are some newer hymns. So the sources are kind of uh, many-fold. Uh, some are hymns that most Protestants in particular would recognize as hymns. Uh, some are hymns that are unique to our church, and then some are also and from a variety of uh, periods. We also have uh, secular songs such as American Republican secular songs, uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic, S Star Spangled Banner, and so forth, um, that are sung if... Uh, on or around generally Fourth uh, of July, so um, you know because if, if theologically there's some connection and belief in the divine origin of our Constitution amongst Latter Day Saints. So yes, sir. I'm interested in that those that stayed behind and didn't go to Utah. You yeah. said one of the younger Smiths formed his own church. And Le yeah, sure. I what's the name of the church? Is it still going? Um, so uh, from 1830, when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints was formed. Um, until Joseph's death in 1844, there were numerous break-off points. So every time he would develop a new doctrine, people would dis disagree and break off, okay, at different points. And what's interesting about this is many of these churches still exist to this day. So you, uh, you can visit them and they kind of uh, encapsulate a period of the Latter-day Saint church history. So you can go there and some are Trinitarian um, and so forth. They don't accept uh, some of the later innovations and, and revelations. Um, but when Joseph died there was no clear successor. Um, because most people believed that Hiram, um, and, and there's actually, and Brother Shigur might get some of this, there's so many similarities between uh, Joseph and uh, Prophet Muhammad um, in terms of uh, the fact of whether it's going to be the, the, the senior disciple or his heir uh, of the body who's going to follow and so forth. Joseph actually called himself the American Muhammad um, and so forth. He was a political leader, had an army and so forth. So very, very similar uh, history there. Um, but the main, the main contenders of who succeeded him were first and foremost the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Okay? Um, that was the first, the major, uh, and they had the most respect because there were 12 of them and so forth. Um, I would say 70% of the church or 60% followed them towards Utah. Another contender was Sidney Rigdon who was the sole remaining member of the church's highest governing body called the First Presidency. Uh, he took a group, and they actually exist today. They're uh, called the Bickertonites, and there are uh, around uh, 15,000, I believe, in existence, mostly in Pennsylvania, that still exist, that followed Sidney Rigdon. Then you had a prophetic contender named James Strang, who uh, took, including many of the Smith family, uh, to uh, Vorey, Wisconsin, and formed his own kingdom there and was a member of the state legislature. He was martyred as well, and there are about, I think, 100 followers of James Strang in existence. The largest, though, group besides the LDS Church is uh, what is now called the Community of Christ. And these were um, uh, members of the church that didn't agree with the Twelve and so forth. Um, they, most of them didn't know at the time what they wanted to do. They kind of kept alive the church. Uh, Emma Smith, Joseph's wife, uh, first wife, um, 
was chief among them. And in 1860, when Joseph Smith III came of age, uh, he reorganized what he called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Missouri, in Independence, Missouri. And uh, that church was led by the direct line descendants of Joseph Smith until the 1990s, I believe. Um, and then now they've had changes where non-Smith family members are leading it. Uh, they have 250,000 members. They're Trinitarian. They're members of the World Council of Churches. They do accept the Book of Mormon, they have, but they're a very liberal church compared to the Utah-based um, LDS church. Um, so uh, in a sense, they are Protestants with some historic anomalies. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, the, then, then, then when you get out to Utah, there are breakaway churches from the Church of oh. Jesus Christ in Utah, and that's where we get... Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you. No, no, that's... I, but that's I where Mormon, that's where polygamous, fundamentalist Mormons come from, is uh, their breakaways from Brigham Young's church. And that's why they continued the temple rituals and polygamy and so forth. Um, Joseph Smith's wife, for instance, did not accept, or rather, she knew her husband was a polygamist. There's no doubt. She actually lived in the house with multiple of his wives. But when he died, she thought she was going to cleanse his name and uh, reject it and would not acknowledge that he had ever um, had plural wives. And uh, it wasn't only until recently that the uh, Community of Christ, formerly the RLDS Church, has acknowledged that Joseph was a polygamist. So, anyway, that's just the, uh, but yeah. Any other questions? Anyone else? Yeah, Brother Biddle. Yes, I was curious. If, uh, if the prophet of the church considered uh, Freemasonry to be a, a continuer of a similar priesthood, or sure. maybe even the same priesthood, but in a degenerated form, Mm -hmm. What attraction was there after he had made that statement for uh, for Latter Day Saints to become Masons if they were if they already possessed a superior priesthood, if you will? I mean, and that's kind of what my interpretation was. Um, you know, Joseph Joseph's thoughts were changing all the time. Um, you know, he was uh, he he didn't like he didn't like pronounce the church in 1830 and in its pristine current form. It was a development of doctrine um, and so forth. So. Joseph might have believed that certain elements were, uh, you know, came from ancient Israelite temples, um, but just because he said something did not make it doc doctrine per se. You know, uh, this is a difference between, let's say, um, I don't know, Catholics with the doctrine of papal infallibility when the Pope speaks from ex cathedra, you know, chair Peter, it's verbatim, this is doctrine. Um, our prophet doesn't function like that, even though many members act like he does. Um, so Joseph might have made a statement to that effect, but that doesn't make it necessarily the authoritative interpretation and so forth. So my interpretation and what I kind of think is the uh, balance is, yeah, they might have believed some of this is ancient, it comes from that, but it was more, more than likely a very convenient form of uh, conveying a, uh, like I said, moral truths and doctrinal truths. So, but I don't have a perfect answer. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right, well, thank you all so much, and uh, pleasure being here. Thank you.